Hi, I'm Jane Rudolph. And I'm Monsignor Charles Minor. I'm Father Joe Glass. Welcome to Real to Real. We're finally in our Fourth of July weekend, the one we've been looking forward to. I always do. Uh, Monsignor Woods, now my old friend, uh, he and I used to spend every Fourth of July together walking up and down Chestnut Street in Philadelphia to Independence Hall. Oh, that's an appropriate way to do it. I don't have any traditions, I think, except a good barbecue. I like a nice really? barbecue. I always like the Fourth of July weekend. It's Not getting one. your feet wet in the ocean in New Jersey? Well, sure. Growing up back home in Belford, we did that quite regularly. Grew up very near to the ocean, mm -hmm. but not so much now in Trenton. I can get my feet wet in the river. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing that you get in the summertime is freckles, and tonight we're going to introduce you to Freckles and Friends, and that's an institution teaching children. You'll find out all about it. Not so much freckles. I thought my senior Dan Murray will talk to us about from the pulpit, but certainly friendship and the friend needed when we begin to understand a pro-life idea from the scriptures. St. Francis Homes for Boys is turning a corner celebrating their 100th anniversary and tonight we're going to meet Fran Swacky who's here to unveil a new program being started by St. Francis Homes. And from a home for boys to a home for girls. Now, Monsignor, we read a statistic that with young unmarried girls, teenagers who become pregnant, only 50% of them return to school at all to get the training that they need. The great troubles that the girls have is, of course, the indictments they go through first, and then they face the preservation of the baby and delivery of the baby. Then the whole child has to be cared for. So we think in terms of taking care of the whole mother and the whole baby. And it's a continual a whole health process. We want to watch it now. Parenthood is something young couples dream about. Many believe raising a family is one of the keys to success. But in the case of a single adolescent, an unplanned pregnancy can be a nightmare. That's why the Teenage Parent Center in Akron, Ohio opened nearly 20 years ago. Center started because uh, some of our uh, counseling staff, who at that time were heavily involved with uh, persons placing children for adoption, uh, saw a need for support for women who uh, were bearing children, uh, uncertain on, very often of how to manage those children, how to manage the pregnancy, and so forth. The staff saw many needs there, saw uh, very little support in the community for that problem and decided to find a way to, to intervene. Robert Lobby is the executive director of Family Services of Summit County, Ohio. He takes a holistic approach to serving the needs of the girls and their families. Teenage pregnancy is a, uh, is a, a situation that affects not just this individual girl, but it affects her parents. Or, her uh, extended family. Um, the program is, is aimed at addressing multiple needs of the girl, social, physical, educational. So we try to intervene uh, with a family unit rather than simply with the individual girl who is experiencing the pregnancy. And we want the commitment of the entire family to that. So we require that uh, when the girl first comes to talk about the program, first begins to explore involvement with us, that she come to that interview with her parent or guardian so that everyone is together on, uh, in their understanding of uh, what we hope to accomplish, why we hope to accomplish it, that we'll need parental support for what we're doing. Tell me about your family. How has your family accepted having a... Um, a well, at first it was like any other day was like, she got pregnant. I don't believe it. Of all people, but you really got pregnant. They just they didn't were, expect that from you. Yeah. All right. And then, you know, as months went on, they came to, you know, well, it's here. We can't change it, so we just have to, you know, live with it. Mm -hmm. So they accepted it now. One of the greatest needs of a pregnant teen, and one which often is overshadowed, is education. Nationally, 98% of adolescent mothers choose to keep their babies but only half complete their education. At the Teenage Parents Center, the girls are required to continue their schooling, and 83% of them graduate. They come to school at the Teenage Parents Center pretty much like they would their home school. Our, our schedules are a bit less traditional, and we feel that's part of the, the advantage of the program, because with pregnant teenagers, they automatically have a number of other appointments that they have to keep, either with their physician um, or the welfare department, so forth. Generally, as with most teenagers, if they have those kind of appointments, 
you may not see them during the entire school day. So we allow a certain, certain periods of time throughout the week that they can maintain or make those other appointments. In addition Judy Joyce that, administrates the program at the program Teenage Parents Center. She is proud of the I teachers who are dedicated to working with the girls. I think, though, that, that after being there for a year or two, and one of our teachers has been there for many years, they, they really develop more of a sensitivity to working with that particular population. Um, most have not worked just strictly with females, and certainly most have not worked just strictly with pregnant females. And so it, it's, it's a bit different for them, but I think they're, they're real good staff, seem to have a real sensitivity to the problems that these young girls have. And every once in a while, we make decisions when we're not even thinking about the problem. It just sort of comes to you. It's more or less intuition. That's what the essay's about. It's a continuous process from the point at which they join the program until the, they leave the program. Um, in addition to their regular scholastic things, you know, math, English, that sort of thing, uh, we have programs that deal with parenting, uh, child care. Uh, prior to the delivery, there is considerable discussion of what it, what it, what's involved in a delivery, the development of the child. Uh, uh, in order to lessen anxiety about the delivery of the child, uh, to prepare the, the students well for that experience. Um, after the birth of the child, there are the, the normal things of uh, bathing a baby and caring for a baby and nutrition, all of those right. things. Right. And one of the things you really want to make sure you're doing with him at this age is keeping him down on the floor, because where he's gaining his strength to learn how to walk and to get up on his hands and knees is right now on the floor. Don't put Unlike it some programs, this teen parent program doesn't end when the baby is born. The center provides nursery and daycare services so the young mothers can finish school. But more importantly, the staff spends time with the girls, teaching them how to be parents. Well, that's helpful too, so when my baby, well, she's go through, like, experiences, little things, like, she might be crying a lot. I might know why she's crying a lot. Helps me know that. And helps me, it shows me how to like change her and stuff. Like when she did come home, I knew most of the things, how to take care of the baby. But my mother was there to help me, but I did most of it on my own because they helped me and showed me things to do. In addition to the support they receive from their counselors, teachers, and families, the girls may also find consolation in knowing that the Catholic Church has opened her doors to them. The Teenage Parents Center is located in the former St. Bernard's Elementary School. Father Paul Schindler is the pastor of St. Bernard's Parish. I think it's part of the outreach mission of the church. There is a definite need for uh, assistance in, in the area. Uh, and of course, go, just going along with the teaching of the church to assist and support mothers who uh, are pregnant, um, who are pregnant out of wedlock in many cases, um, rather than with all the other options that they have uh, or, or that they are offered by our world today, and especially in the, the areas of abortion and stuff, to give them some very viable options and assistance in uh, having their children and raising their children. It is such a need that uh, this is where the church should be, I think. When adolescents have babies of their own, they're forced into a responsibility for which they are not yet ready. Hopefully, the program offered by the Teenage Parents Center can help to lighten the load while giving them hope during their time of need. It's hard. It's, it's real hard trying to get everything done in that and taking care of him and yourself and then other things. But it's just hard. It is hard, and our job is to make it possible, and I think that should be easy. And your job is to stay with us tonight on Real to Real. Since 1981, Real to Real has been proclaiming the good news by bringing you stories of Christian faith in action. 
We do it by roaming the Delaware Valley, searching for people of faith, hope, and charity. But like all modern media, it is an expensive proposition. If you're a new viewer or if you've enjoyed Real to Real for many years, we'd like to thank you for watching and invite you to participate by actively supporting the show. With costs rising all around us, we need your financial support. A donation of five, ten, twenty dollars, or whatever you can send will help to keep us on the air. Send your contributions to Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, room 907, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. And thank you. Hello, I'm Gary Maddox. When I played with the Phillies, reading the pitcher gave me the advantage. But life is not a game. To give yourself the advantage, you have to be able to read. To get the help you need, call the Mayor's Commission on Literacy at 686-8652. Learn to read. It will change your life. One hundred years of service is a long time, and that's what we're celebrating tonight, along with Fran Swahaki, who's the director of St. Francis Holmes Homes for Boys. Congratulations on your hundredth anniversary out there at St. Francis. Thank you very much, Father. I'm very glad to be here today. Yeah, help me with the name. I want to keep saying St. Francis Home for Boys, but technically it's St. Francis Homes. It's for Homes boys. for Boys because uh, we have a group home program, a community-based group home program that consists of eleven homes. And where about 95 to 100 boys reside. And are they scattered all around the archdiocese? Their homes are located in one place? Yes, they're scattered throughout the archdiocese in three counties, six in Bucks County, four in Philadelphia County, and one in Montgomery County. Okay. Now, with all that being said already, give us a quick overview of the program out there at St. Francis. You're pretty much involved with adolescent uh, homes for boys, right? We're, we're adolescents. We deal with adolescents. We're a member agency of Catholic Social Services of the diocese. And we provide care and help and placement services like the group homes uh, for boys, boys who've been neglected or abused. Mm -hmm. We have a long history and we have a long tradition. And in fact, this year, 1988, as you've mentioned, is our centennial year, the 100th uh, anniversary of our founding. Yeah, and I know over that 100 years, St. Francis has really kept changing and, and changing its complexion and services to meet the needs of a changing population in the Delaware Valley. And you've got a new program now that you're about to begin as you start your second century, right? Do you want to explain that a little bit? Yes, out of all of our years of taking care of kids and out of all of our years of providing group care for kids, we find that for many of our boys, uh, it would be a lot better if they can live with families. We feel that Foster families can take better care of our kids in some instances, can give emotionally to our boys, and to give them special attention. That for some of our boys, they can grow and thrive within the healthy family environment. Okay, in a way that maybe they, they're not getting that exposure in the community home, in the group home. Huh? So t tell me, what would be a typical child uh, profile of a child you'd want to place in, in a fo with a foster family? We'd want to place an adolescent boy. He'd be between 12 and 15 years old. He could be a, a white boy, black or Hispanic. He's someone who's been disappointed by the adults in his life. He's been let down. Possibly he's been abused and neglected. He's a boy who, however, who's uh, begun to put his life back together. He's begun to really deal with the hurt and anger in his life and is beginning to trust. And this is the kind of boy that we'd want to place right. in a foster family. So he's already shown some promise in the group home and now ready to be moved into a foster home. What kind of a family are you looking for? Can you do the same thing, turn it around, and give me a quick profile of a typical foster family that you're looking for? We're looking for a special family, obviously. We need a special kind of person or persons to take care of these boys. They must be someone who, is, who are capable of giving of themselves to another. They must be committed, they must be dedicated, and they must show a capacity to work hand in hand with St. Francis. We will form a partnership with, with the foster family to help these boys to improve their life and to provide them with a, with a family setting. Okay, is there any financial compensation involved to the family? Above the rewards of helping kids, of making a difference in their life, seeing a kid grow and mature, watching a boy graduate from high school or stay away from drugs and alcohol, there is financial remuneration above cost. So there's that kind of subsidy as well. But I mean, we should make it clear, nobody's going to make money on this kind of thing, but you do sort of try to help out with the expense of, of taking a child into your home. We help out with the expenses, and while no one's going to get rich, there is something a little above and beyond that in terms okay. of a reward for All these right. good families. Now, I just, uh, I know the program is new, but any indication of 
the length of, of the relationship or the stay in foster care? Any, any insight on that? We would like to provide boys with an established relationship, uh, a long-term relationship where they can benefit from a family where they're going to learn values and learn how to give and learn how to share and learn about love. Okay. So we would see a boy staying in there for uh, a, long, a long period of time, okay. perhaps in many cases till a boy is graduating from high school. Right. Super. Fran, this sounds like a wonderful program. I want to give the number right now. If any of you out there are interested in becoming foster families and working with St. Francis Homes for Boys in this new program, this exciting program, and a very worthwhile one, here's the number to call for more information. It's 215-587-3960. That's 587-3960. Congratulations on the first 100 years and lots of luck with this new foster care program going into your second 100 years, Fran. Thanks Thank for you very much, Bob. Okay. Back to you, Monsignor and Jane. How good to hear Fran talk about foster care. And we think in terms of the totality of life, growing life, but we must remember the totality is a conceived life as well. When we talk about the abortion issue, it's tough to see where our roots are. I mean, where do we begin? Monsignor Ma Daniel Murray is going to point out that we can turn to the scripture to find the foundation of this argument. The Bible is clear in its teaching on the sanctity of human life. Scripture teaches that each life is sacred, that life is a gift of a living God. The Gentile nations fashion gods in their own image. Yahweh creates human beings in his own image and likeness. Each person is therefore vested with an inviolable dignity on the basis of his or her creation. Scripture also teaches that God is the protector of life. God tries to persuade Cain from taking his brother's life. And even when Cain murdered his brother, God protected him, placing a mark on him so that no one who found him would kill him. The story of the flood is the story of how humanity profaned God's gift of life. God takes away the gift, but in the covenant with Noah, God vows never again to destroy any living creature, placing himself squarely on the side of life. Behind the fifth commandment is the idea that human life may not be taken because it is made in God's image. Fertility is a blessing, barrenness a curse. Biological reproduction is not a mere natural event. It is a sign of God's favor. It is grace. Prenatal development is carefully guarded by divine activity, as in Psalm 139. God is intimately involved in the period of gestation, fashioning another unique expression of his image. God consecrated Jeremiah to a prophetic ministry while he was yet in his mother's womb. Jesus' incarnation began at his conception. Belief in the sanctity of life is therefore at the heart of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Christian tradition in all ages have opposed abortion. Those Christians who today advocate abortion stand outside the stream of two millennia of Christian thought. Dr. Malcolm Potts, a pro-abortionist, in a 1970 California Medicine editorial, observes that unborn children are human beings. This, he says, is a scientific fact which everyone really knows. Pro-abortion scientists do not directly refute the testimony of the anti-abortion scientists. Indeed, they could not, for to do so would have been to refute what is taught in every genetics course in every country. Tolerance of abortion cannot be morally reconciled with the Judeo-Christian view of human life. Dr. Potts and others say that the Judeo-Christian view must be swept away by a new ethic. Social acceptance of abortion is at the vanguard of that new ethic. It will be necessary, he says, to place relative rather than absolute values on human life. The shift in values is only the beginning. If society can tolerate the destruction of an unborn human being, it will come to tolerate the destruction of other classes of human beings as well. Broad acceptance of abortion portends the death of the Judeo-Christian ethic. What is happening is that the quality of life ethic is eclipsing the sanctity of life ethic. The abortion debate is not a conflict over when human life begins. It is a conflict between two views of human life. The Judeo-Christian on the one hand says that each person is valuable because God created them in, God, in his image. The unborn are human beings. Their lives are sacred and have absolute value. They have an immortal soul. The modern view says that human beings are valuable only if society thinks them valuable. Justice Harry Blackman upended one of the pillars of the sanctity of life ethic, the oath of Hippocrates. The oath explicitly forbids abortion. Blackman dismissed it as a Pythagorean manifesto and not the expression of an absolute standard of medical conduct. The Judeo-Christian resistance to abortion represented for Blackman a peculiar dogma, one to which ancient religion, pre-Christian paganism, did not adhere. Roe versus Wade made the quality of life ethic, at least as it pertains to abortion, the law of the land. We must take a clear stand. Resistance to abortion is no mere option for the Christian. It is an imperative. On this eve of July 4th, 1776, when we first signed our independence, remember it is freedom for everyone, no matter what the age. 
We have more to say about formation of children, so please stay with us and, and learn. Look, Freddy, our tree has pretty decorations on it. It's not bare anymore. I didn't like the tree when it was all bare. Twenty years ago, leukemia and related diseases took the lives of enough people to fill a ballpark. But today, more people are surviving, thanks to research by the Leukemia Society of America. Hi, I'm Gary Carter. Join the team that's striking out leukemia. The Leukemia Society of America, we're closing in on a killer. We welcome your comments and suggestions and encourage you to write to us at Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, Room 907, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. Or call us during regular business hours at 215-668-9842. Well, Jane, we talked about time of conception, adolescence, and now I think the most important thing is to learn that formation begins with the preschool child. And it's during those very tender years that a lot of things are started, especially in a child's spiritual life. But a little one can understand church dogma. Well, that's where freckles and friends step in. Yeah. Hi, friends. Hi. Hi, Hi Freckles. Hi. Meet Freckles the Clown and her animal friends, the stars of a unique video series. This series is called Freckles and Friends, and it's the brainchild of Sister Carolette Grote of Toledo, Ohio. Freckles and Friends is designed to teach youngsters about God in a clever, colorful way. Sister Carolette developed this video series in response to a need for quality religious education programs for young children. People want to teach their little children about God and it, really it should begin in the home, but a lot of people don't have the time to do it or don't feel they're qualified to do it or they're too busy doing other things. So they usually send their children to the preschool religion program at the parish. The people that are down in the church basement teaching the little children are often just volunteer people that are not even teachers. I mean, they're great people. They love children. That's why they volunteered to do it. But they're not sure, like, what do you do with little children for an hour, and how much can they understand about God, or what are you trying to do? And so I thought, well, it would be easier on these volunteers if I could produce a tape, like a Mr. Rogers tape or a Sesame Street tape, that would teach them religion and about God, so that all they would have to do would be put the tape in and watch it with the children and then just do what the tape says. Sister Carolette chose Freckles and the Animal Puppets as the program stars because she wanted characters that could keep children's attention. And each character has its own distinct personality. Look, Freddy, our tree has pretty decorations on it. It's not bare anymore. I didn't like the tree when it was all bare. I have one little animal, this little monkey, Emily, who kind of takes the children's point of view. So, and then the other animals in Freckles try to teach Emily what it's all about. Freckles and her animal friends introduce several songs in each program. The songs are then sung later in the program by a group of children. These songs serve as entertainment and instructional tools. I think the songs are what the children are going to learn, that they're going to be singing the songs at home. They won't remember the dialogue or the script, but when they hear the song or sing the song, they'll remember the whole lesson. I purposely put the sing-along in it because a lot of times teachers say, well, I can't sing. We're going to skip the music because I can't sing, or I'm only doing this once a week, so I don't have time to learn these songs. So it's a built-in music program that the teacher doesn't have to worry about. She just has to sit back and sing the songs with the children. Each program also features an art project demonstration. That's so young viewers don't have to watch the entire half-hour program in one sitting. When uh, Freckles comes out and decorates the bare tree with all these little fuzzies, well then for the art project for that, we're going to have the children make little fuzzies that they can decorate around the house. So the art lesson always pertains to the religion lesson that we're trying to put across. But we demonstrate it on the tape so the teacher doesn't have to know, think it up or know how to do it. The children and the teacher watch it on the tape, then they turn the television off, and then they all perform. 
What appears on the television screen is the result of hard work and creativity. Sister Carolette writes the scripts and the music for each Freckles and Friends show. And for her, it takes a lot of walking and talking to put each program together. So once I get the whole thing, what message, like the scenario of a show, you know, what are the main messages? Then I usually go to the music and say, now what could I sing about in this? Then I might just hum melodies in my head and just think, da 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 You know, and if it sounds good, I might say, that's no good, and then just keep on recording. But sometimes it comes through real easy just to make up a song in your head and sing it to the recorder. Then I come back and put the recorder on and sit at the piano and listen to that, listen to a line, and then try to write it down, and listen to another line and try to write it down. And then I get the meter of it, and then I write the lyrics for it, and then go back and put the lyrics on to the song. Of course, these characters couldn't exist without these characters, the puppeteers, who breathe life into these animal puppets. We have some really good puppeteers that, you know, have a certain accent and a certain way of speaking and a certain way of acting that I think the children will come to know after they've seen a few tapes. You can almost anticipate. You know, even like when uh, Jerry was pretending he's one of the innkeepers or something for the Christmas show. You know, he would, ha, 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 even though he has no room. He just always oh, Jerry. You know, and Fritz is always the understanding big brother type. I, the puppeteers we have are very good as far as staying in character and making their puppet a real friend of the children. Through these lively characters, Sister Carolette wants to convey a message of love to all youngsters. So I want them to know that no matter what happens, they have a father, a God in heaven that really loves them and takes care of them and that they are special. They have to know right when they're real little that they are very special and that they are loved and that we're supposed to, that God wants us to love each other because he loves each one of us so much. I don't want them to think that God is a love that you have to earn. I want them to know that it's freely given, that God really loves them. And I just want them to know that, to feel secure in God's love no matter what happens. We're out of time, so have a very safe 4th of July. Goodbye, and God bless you. Good night. See you next week. Many people would like a book to help them to pray. Others would like one that would help them to understand scripture. That's why Monsignor Walsh wrote The Kingdom at Hand. It is a prayer book based totally on the Gospel of St. Matthew. So if you want a book that will help you to pray or to understand the scriptures, then you want to get a copy of The Kingdom at Hand. Just call 215-668-HOPE right now. Or during the week.